Hello, warm greetings and welcome to the lecture number five in our series of geometrical and physical optics lectures. We are halfway through the course and with this lecture we are changing the topic from geometrical optics to the physical optics. So for the next four lectures, including this one, we're going to be talking about another subfield of photonics that's known as physical optics. The title of this lecture is Light Waves, and after finishing this lecture, you will be able to describe a whole bunch of different phenomena. We are going to review the concept of light waves and wave fronts. We are establishing the relationship between the two. We are also going to define a phase angle and its relationship to a wave front. This is directly related to a light being considered a wave. We will see that light can come in a form of so-called electromagnetic wave that's to a certain extent similar, but also different from the water waves. An important theoretical concept that's related to the waves is so-called Huygens principle that we are going to define in this lecture and show how it is used to predict the shape of a succeeding wave fronts. We will state the conditions required for producing interference patterns. That's another important subject that we're going to be covering in this and the subsequent lectures, the concept of interference and diffraction. We are going to define the constructive and destructive interference. And we are going to take a closer look at a laboratory setup that's designed to produce a double slit interference effect and pattern. That's an important experiment in physical optics and general in photonics. We are going to state the conditions for an automatic phase shift of 180 degrees at an interface between the two optical media. And finally, we are going to learn how to calculate the thickness of the thin films that will be used to enhance or suppress reflected light. Before we dive deeper into the subject of physical optics, we also want to draw a clear distinction between the subjects of physical optics and the contents of a geometrical optics. When the light interacts with large objects such as prisms or mirrors or lenses that are large in a sense of their dimensions being much, much larger than the wavelength of light, then we will be applying or we apply the laws of geometrical optics as we have seen in the previous four lectures. So again, optical components are having dimensions that are much larger than the wavelength of light. If you're looking at the wavelength of visible light, we're talking about the wavelengths in a range of 400 to 700 nanometers. Nanometer is 10 to the negative 9 of a meter, so that's significantly smaller than the size of any visible uh, prism or mirror or lens that we have been dealing in the previous lectures and, and in the photonics lab. However, if we were to examine certain image points with a microscope, then we would see a structure in a point or a structure that's explained only when we invoke the wave nature of light. And that's exactly the subject of physical optics. So, for example, when light waves pass around small objects, such as a 100 micrometer diameter of a human hair, or through small opening, such as 50 micron pinhole, in such a case, geometrical and ray optics concepts that we introduced in the previous four lectures cannot be applied and cannot account for the light patterns that are produced on the screen beyond these objects. Only wave optics or physical optics can lead to the correct interpretation of such patterns. Clear visual distinction between the geometrical optics on one side and physical or wave optics on the other side is shown on the bottom of this slide. On the left hand side, we see uh, two phenomena that are to be explained using geometrical optics, such as light refraction through the prism or light passing through some sort of filter or a lens, as opposed to the picture on the right hand side where we see a diffraction grating as well as a single slit of a very very small width uh, that's on the order of scale of the wavelength of light uh, and if we have that type of objects uh, that are having dimensions on the order of scale of the wavelengths of light then those objects are creating a very distinct types of pa patterns that can be explained only using wave optics so what do we exactly study in the physical optics we are going to study a few important phenomena, interference, diffraction, and polarization. We will be playing with optical components called gratings. We are also going to be analyzing thin film coatings that are put on a certain optical components. Let's briefly define these three phenomena that we mentioned here. Interference is a phenomenon when two or more light waves are passing through the same region and adding or subtracting from each other. Diffraction is when the light waves pass through small openings or around small obstacles and spread, 
And finally, polarization is a specific phenomenon that occurs to the transverse nature of the electric field vibration in a propagating electromagnetic wave. We are going to be talking about that more in detail in the slides that follow. Here we also want to draw a clear distinction between the two phenomena shown here on the right hand side of this slide. As you can see, both of these phenomena are creating the rainbow of colors or they are basically breaking down the white light into all colors of the visible spectrum. However, there is a clear distinction. The picture on the left hand side is showing the creation of the rainbow of colors using the phenomenon of refraction through the prism that we explained in the previous lectures. While on the right hand side, we are using a diffraction grading and we are using a phenomenon called diffraction to uh, split the white light into uh, multiple colors of the rainbow uh, as shown here on the right hand side. So to really understand the physics of waves and the uh, wave motion that are at the core of the wave or physical optics, we first want to go back to the definition of a light waves and the wave runs. So wave optics treats light as a series of propagating electric and magnetic field oscillations. This wave behavior is similar to that of water waves. You can see a comparison with the water waves here on the right hand side of this slide. We see here a very distinct wave uh, fronts of a circular shape that are propagating from the, from the source of a wave. And then we also have waves that, are, that is basically the direction of the propagation of the particles of water that are shown here through this outward pointing arrows. So that would be the waves in our, in our case of light, we are talking about the light waves. And then, as I already mentioned, if we connect all the points along the crest of a single wave, we are creating so-called a wave front. The relationship between the wave fronts and the light waves is very clear. And that relationship is perpendicular. In other words, the light rays or light waves are perpendicular or at, or at the right angle relative to the wave fronts. So these two important properties of a light wave so-called uh, light rays and wave fronts are at the core of a wave or physical optics that we are going to be using to analyze a whole bunch of different phenomena such as interference, diffraction and polarization. Now that we are talking about light as a wave, it's very important to really understand the physical concept of a wave. The wave represents the motion both in a space and in time. In other words, if you look uh, along the wave and if you are in some unique wave able to stop the time, what you would see is a repetitive behavior where each wave that has been stopped in time is represented by its crests or maximum and then there is also uh, there are also valleys or minima between the waves. So we are talking about a repetitive behavior uh, that is shown here on the top of this uh, diagram as you can see here, we are talking about the wave profile along the pond at a certain instance of time. So if we are moving along this uh, horizontal axis, we see that at different locations along this axis, we have a maximum of the wave or a crest of the wave, such as here at this point C and that point C, etc. And then we also have a minima or valleys within this wave pattern. And these minima and maxima are distributed in space, meaning at different locations, at different positions, you have a maximum and then at some other locations, you have a minimum of a wave and there is a repetitive behavior that is spread uh, throughout the space. Now, in addition to that, we also have a wave motion in time. In other words, if you're looking at a fixed position on, a, on the ocean, let's say that's a wavy ocean, let's say you are in a boat, you are anchored at a specific location, then still even at that location, your position in the boat is going to be changing. You're going to be, going to be basically oscillating up and down at that specific location. In other words, at a specific time instance, you will be on the crest of the wave. And then after some time, you're going to go into the valley and then again up and down. So you have this wavy behavior of this wave motion that is spread uh, in time uh, at a specific location. So these are the two important aspects of every wave that are important to be remembered. So again, a wave represents the repetitive behavior that exists both in a space and in time. We can define a few important properties of each wave. The distance between the two successive peaks of the wave is so-called wavelength. So if you measure the distance between these two points C, 
that distance is defined as a wavelength of a wave. We are using the Greek letter lambda to indicate or the label uh, wavelength of a wave. So again, if you would be looking at a wave on the ocean and you're measuring the distance between the two waves, that distance between the two waves is so-called wavelength. In addition to wavelength, we also have a period. The period represents the time between the two successive peaks of the wave in time. So if you are anchored in a boat, the time that it takes from, for you in the boat to go from the uh, up position back to down and then uh, back up to the up position represents the period of the wave. So if you measure the time between the two crests, two peaks of the wave, that time is defined as a period of the wave. So there's two distinct parameters that characterize the wave, one being the wavelength that represents the distance between the two crests in a space, and then the period that represents uh, the time that passes between the two crests uh, of the wave at a specific uh, unique location. In the same way how in the case of a water wave, the particles of water are oscillating, in the case of a light, we are talking about so-called electromagnetic wave. In other words, in the case of light, what oscillates are so-called electric and magnetic field. So we have electric and magnetic field vibration in the case of a light wave in the similar way as the oscillation of the water particles in the ocean wave. So it is the electric field and the magnetic field in light waves that vary between the positive and negative maxima in direction that's transverse or perpendicular to the direction of the propagation of the wave. That's also very important to recognize and remember. So if you're looking at this picture on the right, you can see that the wave is propagating along this Z direction that's indicated by the arrow. At the same time, you have a vector of electric field that's pointing upwards in the direction of the Y axis. And then you also have a magnetic field that's shown here by this arrow, by this vector in the direction of the X axis. And you can very clearly see that the arrow or the vector of the electric field and the vector of magnetic field are perpendicular or they are at right angle relative to each other. And then they are also at the right angle relative to the direction of the propagation of the wave along the Z axis. So that so-called transverse wave. Again, remember that in the case of a transverse wave, the quantities that are oscillating or vibrating are oscillating or vibrating in a direction perpendicular to the direction of the propagation of the wave. We also have so-called longitudinal waves. In the case of a longitudinal waves, the quantities that are vibrating are vibrating in the direction that's parallel to the propagation of the wave. Longitudinal waves are, for example, sound waves. So sound wave, in the case of a sound wave, what vibrates there are molecules of air, and it turns out that molecules of air are vibrating in direction that is parallel to the propagation of the sound wave. So that's so-called longitudinal wave, as opposed to the electromagnetic wave, such as light or water waves in the ocean, that are so-called transverse waves. So if the electric field vibrates along the Y direction, such as shown here, and the magnetic field or B field vibrates along the X direction, as shown in the picture, in such a case, the light or electromagnetic wave will be propagating along the Z direction. Now that we introduced the wave behavior of light, we want to look at some of the most important phenomena that are related to the light that can be explained only if you're looking at light as a wave. One being interaction of the light waves uh, through so-called superposition. So the question that we're trying to answer is what happens at a certain point in space when the two light waves pass through that point at the same time? So the answer to this question is when two or more waves move simultaneously through a region of space, each wave proceeds independently as if the other were not present. Two resulting waves displacements at any point in time are going to be the vector sum of the displacements of the two individual waves. What do we mean exactly by that? Focus on the picture that you're seeing here and as you can see here we are dealing here with two waves. There's a wave that's represented here by this dotted line so we see this uh, repetitive behavior. So the peak of this wave is equal to capital A sub 2 and then there's also another light wave that's shown here by this thin curve with a peak equal to capital A sub 1. We can observe that these two light waves have different peaks, A1 and A2, 
And also they have different wavelengths. The wave that's represented by the dotted line has the wavelength that's significantly shorter than the wavelength of the wave represented by the thin line. So if, if you're measuring the distance between the two peaks, wave represented by the thin curve, that distance is much larger than the distance between the two peaks in the wave represented by the dotted line. So the question is, what is going to happen when you have these two waves in a space? It turns out that they will be interfering in the sense that their peaks and valleys will be adding up. And so if you take for any point along the X or horizontal axis, if you take a specific point and you take the, the, the amplitude of the wave at that specific point, you will see that the amplitudes of the, these two waves, the one with a dotted curve and one with a full thin curve, are going to be different. For example, at this location here, where the amplitude of the wave 2 represented by the dotted curve is equal to 0, the other wave is uh, at the peak, so you will be adding those two values uh, and creating another point that's going to be representing the superposition of these two waves. So if you do that for each point along the horizontal axis and you add the points that represent the superposition or the sum of these two waves, you're going to be creating the resulting wave that's shown by this uh, thick curve. So you can see how these two waves added uh, to each other to create this other wave uh, behavior that's still to a certain extent repetitive, but you can now clearly see that at the certain locations you will have a very, very strong peak that's uh, produced by the uh, strong amplitudes of, of the two uh, waves that produce that resulting wave, while at some other locations the waves are going to be cancelling out. For example, this location here, we can see that the thick curve is uh, passing through the zero, uh, where uh, the wave uh, 1 had a positive amplitude, while the wave 2 had a negative amplitude. So when the, this positive and the negative amplitudes of the two waves added up, they actually were cancelling each other out because they, they were with the opposite sign. So what you're seeing here is so-called interaction of the light waves or so-called interference that can be uh, mathematically described through the, through the concept of so-called superposition. With this slide, we are going one step further and looking uh, much closer in the detail as to how two light waves can uh, be interfering, we have something called constructive and something called destructive interference. So if you're looking at the picture A on this slide, you can see two waves, wave one and wave two, that are almost identical. In other words, every time wave one has a peak, the wave two also has a peak. So those two peaks will be adding up, creating a very large peak in the resulting wave. Also, if you look at uh, this negative peak of the two waves here, they will be also adding up, creating a very large negative peak in the resulting wave. So what we're talking about here is so-called constructive interference. In other words, the two waves, wave one and wave two, are perfectly synchronized, meaning the peaks of one are perfectly uh, aligned with the uh, peaks of the other wave, creating this constructive interference that you're seeing here with the very, very large peaks in a, in a resulting wave. Now, in the picture B, you can see so-called destructive interference. In this case here, the two waves are also perfectly aligned. However, their peaks are uh, the, p the positive peak of one aligns with the negative peak of the other and vice versa. So in other words, uh, when you add the positive values of wave two with the negative values of the wave one in this half cycle here, they will be perfectly canceling out. In other words, the resulting wave is going to be always a zero wave. In other words, there will be no resulting wave. So here we are talking about so-called destructive interference. And then finally, at the picture C, we have a general case of interference when the two waves are not uh, synchronized, they are not phase matched. Uh, you can see that the dotted wave, wave number two, has peaks that are occurring at different uh, time instances and uh, locations as the peaks of the wave one. Uh, so the resulting wave is going to have a certain repetitive behavior as shown. However, these peaks in this case are not going to be so pronounced and not so strong as in the case of the full constructive interference shown on the picture A. Here on the right hand side, we have another uh, example of uh, in, uh, interference between the two waves. We can see here two circular waves that are originating from the two sources, source, source, source S1 and source S2. So the source S1 is producing this circular wave with the wave fronts that are represented by these half circles where the full lines are representing positive peaks and then dotted lines are representing negative peaks. 
And then what you can also see here is the same thing for the second wave originating from the source S2. Uh, you can see a certain locations where the full lines of the second wave are overlapping or intersecting with the full line of the first wave. Those would be these dots that are full, full uh, dark dots. That's where we have a full constructive interference. While there's certain locations where we have a positive peak of one wave and negative peak of the other wave are canceling out at those locations, we have destructive interference. So if you put the screen at a specific location, the fact that that, that, that screen is going to be capturing different uh, dots, both those uh, where you have a constructive and those that you have that, that creating destructive interference would result in a very specific uh, interference pattern that is going to consist of a bright and dark spots that are interchanging as shown on this picture on the right hand side. Let's now introduce the Huygens principle. This is a principle that's been established by a Dutch physicist Christian Huygens, one of the greatest physicists of all times a great inventor who uh, discovered, uh, among others, the rings of the Saturn and as well as the Moon Titan and contributed greatly uh, to the fields of mechanics and optics. So this uh, principle, so-called Huygens principle, is very important, is at the core of the theoretical uh, physical optics. Uh, it states that each point on a regularly shaped or oddly shaped wavefront in a given medium can be treated as a point source of secondary spherically shaped wavelets. These secondary wavelets spread out in all directions with a wave speed characteristic of that medium. The developing wavefront at any subsequent time is the envelope of these advancing secondary wavelets. So what this exactly means? If you're looking at a specific wave that's represented by the wavefront, so let's say we're dealing with a planar wavefront as the one here, you can see a whole bunch of points along this uh, crest of a wave or wavefront that are labeled here as a P1, P2, P3, P4, etc. Now it turns out that mathematically you can look at this wave front as a location of the whole bunch of light sources that are represented by these points. So it's not just the points, points P1 through P8, there's a whole bunch of points in between. So now if you look at each of these different points and imagine that point as being a single source of a wave that's creating these circular waves, you can see these circular waves here that are originating the, the, their center here is at the point P4. So we are considering the point P4 as a single source, an additional wave that's shown here by these circular wave fronts. And let's say you construct such a wave for each point along this wave front. So you have the same, same circular wave fronts originating from the source P2, from the source P1, P5, P6 as shown here and then each and every point between these uh, points uh, P1 through P8. So all those different uh, circular waves, if you sum them up using the superposition at, as explained on the previous slide, they will sum up and uh, create the original light wave that consists of these planar wave fronts. So that's at the core of the Huygens principle. So the Huygens principle basically states that if you take one specific wave front in a wave and you consider each point along that wave front as a source of a circular wave, those circular waves will be interfering through constructive and destructive interference that would be producing these original planar wave fronts that we have in our original wave. That's at the core of the Huygens principle. Now, why is this important to us? If you are looking at this type of a planar wave front, and let's say you put some sort of obstacle on the wave of this planar wave front, and that obstacle is, let's say, a screen or some sort of like a wall, or and let's say that screen or wall, they have just a small opening, and that opening in that wall is as small as one point on your wave front. Then what's gonna happen over on the other side of that obstacle is going to be the only wave, only one single circular wave that is created by that specific point that's positioned exactly at that, at that uh, slitter or that opening. While the rest of our circular waves will be blocked. So what you're gonna be having over on the other side is a new wave that's of a, sphere, of a spherical shape. You can actually see that here on this uh, beautiful picture of, uh, you know, of the ocean. So you have some waves here, right? So there is a waves that are coming from the ocean. And then there is this uh, small opening here that you can see. And you can see that on, on this uh, picture, 
where you have this opening. It's almost like a, there was a, a pebble dropped that created this circular wave. So if you have some sort of planar wave that's uh, coming from the ocean right there, that planar wave, that crest that's like along the line, you can look at each point along the crest of that wave as a single source, but all those sources will be blocked by this, by this wall, by this rock, except for this single point here, where you're gonna have just one single source of the wave of a circular shape that is passing uh, into this small uh, isolated portion of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the beach, where you see these uh, very, very, very distinct circular patterns uh, that originate from this point here, where we had the opening. Okay, now the concept of the Huygens principle that we introduced on the previous slide can be directly applied to a very important experiment in wave optics that put the foundations to the whole wave optics and later on as well uh, the quantum optics. That so-called Young's double slit interference experiment. So what you see here is, is a wave, a plane wave, that's been represented by these planar wave fronts or these straight lines that represent the crest of a wave. And you can see here the obstacle, some sort of screen that's been placed uh, with a small opening. And as we said, if you're looking at this wave front here immediately at the obstacle, this wave front here can be looked at superposition of a whole bunch of spherical waves that are originating from each point along this wave front. All those spherical waves will be blocked except for one specific spherical wave that's created or that originates from this point S. Uh, zero that's exactly uh, positioned at the opening uh, of this uh, of this uh, obstacle or this screen and that's what can be seen over on this side here where we have a circular wave so our planar wave has been transformed into circular wave front circular wave that is uh, propagating away from this uh, first obstacle uh, with a uh, one single opening now we have here another screen and this other screen uh, has two slits, two openings. That, uh, that's why we call this a double slit experiment. So here we have two openings. So in the same way how we had previously applied the Huygens principle, this time we're gonna be applying the Huygens principle to this circular wave front here. And we are gonna be considering only two points along that circular wave front that are being passed by this second screen. And those two circular wave fronts will be defined by the points S1 and S2 that would represent these two new sources of the waves that uh, would be created uh, beyond this screen. And those two waves can be seen here. So there is a one wave, one wave with the wave fronts uh, in a shape of a circular wave fronts with the origin or center at the at the point S2. And then we also have here another or the second wave, second circular wave that is originating from the point S1. And as we explained on the previous slides, these two waves are gonna be interfering with each other at certain locations. You will have intersection of the peak of one wave and the peak of the other wave. Uh, there we have a constructive interference. And then there's also locations where we have uh, the destructive interference, meaning the positive peak of one, aligns with the negative peak of the other and they are canceling each other out, uh, creating the dark spot. So if you put the screen at a certain location away, you're gonna see that at this screen, at the certain locations, you're gonna have a constructive interference that would be resulting in these bright spots. And then there's also certain locations where you have a destructive interference, where the positive and negative peaks of the two waves are uh, canceling out. At those, those locations, you're gonna have dark spots uh, on the screen. So we have a very, very distinct pattern that's being created on the back screen, so-called interference fringes, where we have dark spots and uh, bright spots uh, interchanging along the screen that's been positioned. That's a result of a constructive and destructive interference of the two waves that have been created by this uh, so-called double slit uh, obstacle. So uh, what we described here is so-called the double slit interference experiment first established by uh, Thomas Young that's actually at the core of the wave optics and is also a very very important experiment in the theory of uh, quantum optics. It turns out that this so-called Young's double slit uh, interference experiment can be used as a proof of a quantum nature of the light. There's certain mathematics behind uh, this uh, double slit uh, interference behavior 
In other words, we can uh, calculate using certain formulas the position of the bright and dark spots on the back screen. So those formulas are shown on this slide on the bottom. If you want to measure the distance from the from the center of the of the experiment, right? So if you establish some sort of like axis, and then you're measuring from that axis up or down the position of the bright and dark spots, you can calculate those distances using these formulas that you're seeing here. Each of the bright or dark spots has its specific order. So we have a first order, second order bright spot, as well as first, a second, third, etc. Order of the dark spots. The order is basically defined by the by the location of the bright or dark spot relative to the axis of the experiment. So for example, the first bright spot would appear for m equal to zero. So if you take m equal to zero, you'll see that this uh, y sub b is going to turn out to be equal to zero. In other words, the first bright spot, first order bright spot is appearing exactly on the axis of the experiment. And then the next order of the bright spot, the next bright spot is going to appear for m equal to one, plus one or minus one. That is going to define the two bar bright spots immediately next to the, to, the, to the axis of the experiment, one above, one below. And then you can use different uh, integer numbers for m uh, to define the position of the next order of the bright spot in the interference pattern. The same can be applied for the dark spots where we are using the formula that's shown here on the bottom slightly different than the one uh, shown for the bright spots. It's also important to identify what are all these other uh, quantities. You can see lambda here. That's the wavelength of the light that we are using. Uh, small d represents uh, the distance between the double slit screen and the back screen. So this is a uh, small d. And finally, we also have the quantity identified here with a small letter a that represents the distance between the two slits in a double slit screen. So what you can see is that the position of the bright and dark spots is going to be affected by the color of light. In other words, different colors of light will be creating different locations of the bright and the dark spots. It's also going to be affected by the distance between the double slit screen and the back screen, as well as the distance between the two slits in a double slit screen. We can also analyze the intensity of the bright spots in the interference pattern. It turns out that the bright spots that are closer to the axis of the experiment are brighter and as you are moving away to the uh, edges or sides of the back screen the intensity of the bright spots is gonna be reduced in other words there's intensity variation in the interference pattern so we have a specific formula to calculate that that's shown on this slide so we have here e sub zero that, that represents the intensity of the first bright spot and then we have a few other quantities here in the formula, such as lambda or wavelength of the light. D and A have been identified on the previous slide. And finally, Y represents the location of a specific bright spot in the interference pattern. So what we can see here is that the intensity of a specific bright spot is a function of the total intensity of the, of the light. Uh, it's also affected by the wavelength or color of light it's uh, affected by the position of the bright spot in the interference pattern as well as the distance between the double slit screen and the back screen and the distance between the two slits in the double slit screen. With this slide we are continuing our exploration of the interference effects. On the previous slide we looked at the interference created by the double slit experiment. Here we are looking at the interference created by the thin films. Tilt film coatings are very popular and used in photonics. Uh, certain optical components such as lenses, prism, etc. are very often coded by a coding to produce a specific type of interference effect uh, needed, uh, for, needed in applications of that uh, optical component. So let's look exactly what we mean by single thin inter interference. What you see here is uh, some sort of transparent material that's labeled here as a substrate. And then there's also the transparent film or coating of a specific thickness that's labeled here as a letter T placed on the surface of this substrate. So there is a film to substrate interface. And what we have here is a light coming from a certain direction. There is going to be here obviously a reflection at this uh, boundary between the outside media and the transparent film. So we're going to have here, according to the law of reflection, 
uh, a reflected light ray that's shown here as a beam one. And then a certain amount of light is gonna also be passed into the transparent film. Obviously it's gonna get bent or refracted through the uh, phenomenon of refraction. So it's gonna pass from the point A in the direction of the point B. And then it, at this point B, we again have the interface between the two media, interface between the transparent me uh, film and the substrate. At that point, a partial reflection is also going to take place that's going to result in this refle reflected light ray that's passing from the, that's moving from the point B to the point C. And then at point C, we're going to have a partial reflection as well as passing of a certain portion of a light into the outside environment uh, in uh, the direction uh, shown here as beam two. So what we have here is uh, two emerging beams, beam one and beam two. Keep in mind that we are looking here only at the first two emerging beams because there's going to be multiple reflections here through this uh, transparent film and certain amount of light leaking back into the outside environment. But we're gonna be looking at this point for the sake of simplicity only at the two first emerging beams. Now it turns out that light rays or light beams, uh, them being a light waves that have a certain uh, phase behavior, uh, will be either canceling out or uh, adding up using through a concept of interference. In other words, if the two peaks are aligned, there's going to be constructive interference. If the two peaks of an opposite sign are uh, aligned, we're gonna have a destructive interference. So all that is related to so-called phase of the wave. So these two beams, beam one and beam two, the question is uh, how much they are uh, aligned, produce a constructive interference, or they're aligned in a specific way that is going to uh, create a destructive interference. That obviously depends on the total length of these paths through the transparent film, as well as the wavelength of the light that is being used in the experiment. So the wavelength of the light, as well as the thickness of the transparent film is gonna define whether these be two beams, beam one and beam two, will be adding up constructively or will be canceling out destructively. And that is going to define a specific level of interference that's going to exist between the light wave one and light wave two. So what we are doing here is we are also using this converging lens to convert these two beams onto a specific point P that is going to be our observing point. And it turns out that these two beams that are intersecting at P are going to be overlapping and interfering since these two beams travel different paths from point A onward, one in the air, the other partly in the film, a phase difference between them is going to develop and this interference or difference is going to produce either constructive or destructive interference of these two beams, beam one and beam two. So again, we are going to be analyzing this in greater detail on the next slides, but remember as a takeaway that the beams, beams one and two will be interfering constructively or, or destructively based on the wavelength of the light as well as the thickness of the transparent film. So here's the whole math that's behind uh, this so-called single thin interference. So we're looking at the total length AB plus BC. If that length AB plus BC is a t whole number of wavelengths, in such a case, the beam that is passing through the thin film is gonna go back to uh, its phase at the point C. So in other words, the phase of uh, this, this uh, light beam two is going to be the same as the phase of the light beam one because that light beam two is gonna be going to the multiple number of wavelengths. In such a case, we are gonna be having a constructive interference. If on the other side, AB plus BC is equal to the odd number of the half wavelengths, in such a case, beams one and beams two will be subtracting from, much, from one another, or we will be observing so-called destructive interference. There's a math here, so we are looking at uh, delta sub p that uh, represents this uh, difference in a phase that can be calculated as geometrical path length difference between the beams one and two divided by the wavelength of the light uh, in the optical medium from, for beam two or the thin film. So if we do the calculations, we come up with a specific formula shown on the bottom that's telling us that the phase difference between the two beams one and two is going to be the function of the wavelength of a light as well as the thickness of the uh, transparent film and also optical properties 
of the transparent film that are represented here uh, by, the, by its index of refraction n. So these interference effects that are created by the thin film coats can be observed in practice in a case of oil slicks and soap bubbles. So for example, if you're looking at a soap bubble or oil slick, it turns out that the thickness of that um, uh, soap uh, layer in a soap bubble is different at different locations. So in other words, for a specific thickness, as explained on the previous slide, for a specific thickness of the bubble layer, we're going to have a constructive interference for a specific color. So for example, if you look at this soap bubble or this oil slick, at this, at this specific location here, the thickness of the oil slick layer is uh, of the size that is going to produce, that's going to enable the constructive interference of the light blue. And then if you move to the next layer here, the thickness of the oil slick changed to the thickness uh, that is going to produce the constructive interference of the, of the yellow color. So all this white color that's coming from the outside and hitting this oil slick is uh, going to produce different constructive interferences for different colors of the white light based on the thickness, based on the variable thickness of the oil slick at different locations. So that's why we are seeing all these beautiful colors in the case of oil slick or a soap bubble. So again, remember the constructive interference for a specific color of light is going to depend on the thickness of that thin film uh, layer. In the case of oil slick or soap bubble, the thicknesses of the of these uh, oil layers or soap layers are different, producing these different constructive interferences at different locations for a specific color in a white light spectrum. When we are analyzing single thin film interference, it's important to mention a few other concepts that have to be taken to account. We are not gonna, going to be offering you the proof for some of the statements that you're going to be seeing on this slide because that goes beyond the level of this class. However, remember that a light wave that's traveling from a medium of lower refractive index to a medium of higher refractive index automatically undergoes a phase change of 180 degrees or half the wavelength. So in other words, if you're looking at this beam one, under the assumption that the index of refraction of this outside medium is lower than the index of refraction of the thin film, at this location here, there's going to be flip of the peak of the wave so in other words, if we had here the positive peak of the wave, after that wave has been reflected, it's going to immediately undergo a change of the peak from the positive to the negative. So we are talking here about the switch of the phase by 180 degrees. That applies only when, as mentioned, light reflects from the surface or entering or hitting the surface from the medium with a lower index of refraction to the medium on the other side that's of the higher index of refraction. So a light wave traveling from a medium of higher index of refraction to one of a lower index of refraction is not going to undergo the, this phase change. So in other words, when you're looking at the light that's moving from uh, the point B to the point C, there's going to be a partial reflection here back into the, into the transparent film. That light wave is not going to uh, undergo a phase change of 180 degrees because the medium or this transparent film has a higher index of refraction than uh, the index of refraction of the second medium. In addition to the phase change introduced by the path differences, we must always consider the possible phase changes upon reflection at the interfaces is an important takeaway from this slide. Here we have an example. So we are looking at a white light that's incident normally on the surface of a soap bubble. A portion of the surface reflects the green light of the wavelength of 540 nanometers. And the question is to estimate the minimum thickness of the soap bubble film that appears green on a reflection. Okay, so let's see how we can uh, solve this problem. So if you're looking at the soap bubble, soap bubble is obviously made out of soap and it's surrounded by air. We're also going to assume that the soap bubble is mostly water. So for water, we know that the index of refraction is, is equal to 1.33. So if you look at the soap bubble, which is uh, this uh, thin layer of soap, what's going to happen when the light hits the front surface of the soap bubble it's going to get reflected and then also it's going to get passed into the soap and then it's going to get reflected from the inner surface of the soap bubble. So what's important for us is to estimate the path length difference between the two light rays, one that has been reflected at the front surface and then one that's been reflected at the back surface. We are going to assume that both of these light rays 
are normal or perpendicular to the surface of the soap bubble. So if you use the formula given in the previous on the previous slides, the path length difference between these two reflected light rays is going to be equal to 2n t where n is the index of refraction of the water in our case, case soap and then t is going to be the thickness of the film or thickness of the soap bubble so once more delta in phase is equal to 2 n t where n is the index of refraction of the water and 10 is the and then t is the thickness of the soap bubble also our delta r is equal to half of the wavelength since there is an automatic phase shift equivalent to lambda over 2 or 180 degrees at the incident surface if you remember the light that reflects off of the front surface since we are entering from the air that's index of that has index of refraction lower than the water we're going to have 180 degree automatic phase shift during the reflection and that's why we have to take that into account so this lambda over two or half wavelength is equal to the phase shift of 180 degrees that's happening at the front surface so once we take all that into account we can write the formula for the phase difference equal m times lambda zero so under this under this condition we are going to have a constructive interference or or specific color appearance on a soap so bubble so we're going to have to assume the minimum thickness which means that we're going to take m equal to one and then we are going to substitute for the values that uh, we established up there so we have for delta p we have 2 n t plus lambda 0 over 2 is equal to for m we're gonna take m equal to 1 because we want to take the, uh, the, the we want to determine the minimum thickness of the soap bubble so m equal to 1 so this ends up being uh, lambda sub 0 so here we can uh, substitute for the values for n we have 1.33 so 2 times 1.33 gives us 2.66 times the thickness and then this half of the wavelength we can uh, move over to the other side and that's gonna if these two substitute we get lambda over lambda over 2 and then from here we can finally calculate the minimum thickness as lambda sub zero over two times 2.66 and then we can further substitute for the lambda zero it's for 540 nanometers over two times 2.66 and if we do this math we get 101.5 nanometers so once more we have determined the thickness of the soap bubble that is going to create a, a high reflection at a specific wavelength of the green light so if the soap bubble is 101.5 nanometers thick at a specific location a constructive interference is going to happen where the light that's hitting the front surface of the soap bubble and light that's hitting the back surface and it's, it's, it gets reflected these two light rates are going to add up and produce the constructive interference that is going to enable us to see that portion of the soap bubble as a, in a green color the concept of the film film interference has found its application in uh, many different uh, real world examples here we have a single layer anti-reflection coating that's being placed on the glasses. So a single layer film is deposited on the glass substrate, which is a common method of making anti-reflecting coatings of uh, optical surfaces, such as those found in the lenses for cameras, binoculars, or glasses. So what you can see here is a, a profound difference between glasses on the left hand side and glasses on the right hand side you can see here reflection off of the surface front surface of the glass because there is no anti-reflective coating 
if that anti-reflective coating is applied uh, to the top surface of this uh, glass material, then if the thickness of the anti-reflection coating is properly adjusted, uh, this reflection is going to be reduced significantly as it can be seen on the picture on the right hand side. According to the rules of phase change upon reflection, both rays 1 and 2, as shown here in the picture, undergo 180 degree phase shifts equal to lambda uh, over uh, 2, since both reflections occur at interfaces separating lower to higher refractive in indices. What do we mean by that? The, the beam 1 is going to get reflected at this front surface and it's moving from the air which has index of refraction equal to 1 and it's going to get reflected off of the surface of this uh, coating that has index of refraction 1.38. The fact that the first medium has a lower index of refraction than the second medium means that at this point here we're going to have 180 degree phase flip through the reflection. Now at this point here between the, the coating and the substrate we have the same thing. Why? because the coating has a low index of refraction than a substrate 1.38 versus 1.52. So both the reflection at the front surface of the coating and the reflection at the interface between the coating and the substrate would produce 180 degree uh, flip of the phase. Here's another example where we can analyze the case of a single layer anti-reflection coating we want to determine the minimum thickness of an anti-reflection coat of a magnesium fluoride that is to be deposited on a glass surface of index of refraction 1.52 if the coat is to cause white light incident normally on the glass to be highly anti-reflective at specific wavelength of 550 nanometers. Also use as information the index of refraction of magnesium fluoride as being near 1.38. In this problem we are also analyzing the case of interference. In this case we are analyzing anti-refraction which means that we are going to be establishing the condition for a destructive interference where we are going to have a two light rays, light ray 1 and light ray 2 as shown on the picture, uh, destructively interfering. So the formula that we are going to use is as follows. So we have delta in the phase between the two light rays plus delta in phase that may be a product of a reflection is equal to m times lambda zero. Now for the phase difference delta p, we know that that phase difference is equal to two times the index of refraction times the thickness where n represents the index of refraction of the coating and t is its thickness. What we can also observe is that both reflections, both for the light ray 1 and light ray 2, are happening at the surface from the medium with a lower index of refraction to the medium with a higher index of refraction. So, for example, if you're looking at the light ray 1, you can see that it is uh, coming from the air with the index of refraction of 1, and it's getting reflected off of the magnesium fluoride, that's 1.38. So there we would have 180 degree phase shift. However, 180 phase shift also exists on the light ray 2 as it reflects off of the uh, back surface of the coat or boundary between the coat and the substrate. Why? Because as you can observe, magnesium fluoride has index of refraction of 1.38, which is lower than the glass of 1.52. So both of these two light rays will exhibit 180 degree phase shift during the reflection which cancels out so this phase shift due to the reflection is equal to zero. So for the destructive interference to take place we have to take m being equal to one half and then under the assumptions that we established before we can come up with the, the for, uh, following formula so instead of delta p we would replace or substitute 2 times nf times t equal to lambda 0 over 2 delta with the sub r is equal to 0 as explained before and then from here we can get the minimum thickness here we obviously assume that m is the, the lowest possible for the destructive interference which is m equal to half so from here we can extract the thickness and come up with the following formula lambda sub zero times over two times two times nf 
And then here we can substitute for the values. So for lambda sub zero, we have 550 nanometers times time two times two is four times the index of refraction of the magnesium fluoride being 1.38. And if you do this math using your calculator, 550 over four over 1.38 gives us 99.6, 99.6 nanometer. So if this anti-reflective coating made out of magnesium fluoride is about 100 nanometers thick, it is going to produce a destructive interference at a color of uh, green of 550 nanometers. And in such a case, we can consider this magnesium, magnesium fluoride coating as anti-reflective coating for this specific color. The concept of interference uh, through the thin film is also applied to a little more complex type of uh, so-called multi-layer coatings. So we can see here a stack that's composed of alternate layers of high and low index films. Each of these films has an optical thickness of a quarter of the wavelength. Specific analysis can be applied to show that all these emerging beams are going to be in phase, uh, creating constructive interference. These reflections are to be increased to the total reflected intensity. So this quarter wave stack performs as a very, very efficient mirror. Uh, and these types of a high reflectivity thin film stacks are very often used in laser mirrors. This mirror acts as a very uh, reflective surface uh, for a specific wavelength of the light. So that's a profound difference between this type of a multi-layer uh, mirror used in lasers uh, compared to a regular mirror with a, a silver coating on the back that's very often reflective uh, for a very, very wide range of wavelengths. So again, multi-layer types of uh, films are acting as a reflective high, re high reflectivity surfaces uh, for a single wavelength where the thickness of these layers is uh, adjusted to the quarter of the wavelength of that specific light that uh, this um, coding, multi-layer coding has to reflect off. So these multi-layer stacks are used in the design of narrow band interference filters that filter out unwanted light, transmitting uh, only light of a desired wavelength for anti-reflection of over broader wavelength regions, very often in optics industry, so-called high efficiency broadband anti-reflection or HEBAR coatings are used. These coatings are uh, applied specifically for regions of uh, ultraviolet and infrared light, but there's also uh, those that are adjusted for the visible light. We also have so-called V coatings that reduce reflectance to near zero at one specific wavelength for an optical component. And these high reflection coatings are produced over broadbands with multi-layer stacks of thin films just for the anti-reflection coatings. And finally, they are used as over coatings on metallic reflectors that typically use aluminum, silver, or gold as the base metals. And these over coats protect the metals from oxidation and scratching. So the main takeaway of this slide is that interference effects uh, that are one of the most important phenomena analyzed in a wave uh, or physical optics are very, very, very popular and are, have been applied in many different uh, applications uh, where interference patterns are being utilized to create anti-reflective or high-reflective codings uh, for specific application. And finally, to wrap up this first lecture in the series of uh, physical optics lectures, we have analyzed the light waves. We defined uh, the concept of a light wave and a wave front in this lecture. We also looked at the differences between the concepts of physical versus geometrical optics. We introduced so-called Huygens principles that's at the core of wave optics. And then we looked at a few different types of uh, experiments where we can create so-called interference between the light waves. One being the Young's double slit experiment that, as we mentioned, is at the core of a wave optics as well as is used as the proof for the quantum nature of the light. And finally, we also looked at the thin film interference effects. We've seen how we can explain the interference effect on a thin film. And then we also analyzed a few specific real world applications of the interference effects, some natural phenomena such as interference effects on the soap bubbles and oil slicks, as well as their popular use in the laser industry to create specific types of uh, high reflectivity mirrors used in lasers.